And then there's also work in like uh, uh, work that is in collective. And so I'm a member of an organization called Black Space, which is a group of Black urbanists, designers, and, and creatives uh, working together and in a collective uh, to advance uh, work uh, that is around practice, uh, purpose, and power in our various community contexts. Uh, and finally, I do work of very directly in, in the quote unquote urbanist space. I work as an urban designer, urban planner, and even as an urban developer. This is an image of a project uh, designed and built in Kigali, Rwanda uh, that provides for uh, mixed income uh, and affordable housing in a city that has tremendous housing needs. Uh, but for the, the presentation today and with the prompt about thinking about uh, care, I did want to ground uh, the conversation in the idea of collective work and collective practice uh, and share a few examples of that. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm part of an organization called Black Space uh, and, and the uh, impetus for this was a, a conference at uh, Harvard University Black and Design Conference back in 2015. Uh, and this was an opportunity for uh, many of us to sort of meet and connect and, and have a shared uh, experience and a shared uh, uh, sort of understanding of the importance of the work needed in our Black communities. And with that group, the first uh, uh, process was thinking about what is the vision? What is the, the kind of the, the work that we wanted to see? And this is uh, from uh, the Black space organization's uh, vision that we uh, sort of co-create together. It says, uh, the Black space demands a present and future where Black people, Black spaces, and Black culture matter and thrive. And so this idea of, of uh, the, the mattering, right? We all know Black Lives Matter. But what does that mean? What, what does it translate to? How do we experience it? Uh, being connected to this idea of thriving, not just surviving, but thriving. And there are so many different ingredients there uh, that I do think care is an, uh, an important uh, dimension of that work. And so there's the Black Space Manifesto. If you go to blackspace.org, you can download the, the manifesto, a number of other resources there. But how we are doing the work, how do we think about uh, uh, collectivity or practice uh, or how we think about power dynamics are encapsulated in, in these set of principles. Uh, creating circles, not lines, for example. So the idea of uh, kind of how we shift uh, some of our hier hierarchical thinking and approaches that you often are trained uh, to do um, uh, in, in various educational uh, contexts and especially in built environment education. Uh, moving at the speed of trust. This is borrowed from emergent strategy, uh, uh, Adrian Marie uh, Brown's uh, book, uh, that it's important to and working in and with the community to, to kind of do that work that is centered on trust building. And that sometimes takes time, especially in, in contexts where there has been a systematic harm or underinvestment uh, or, or other issues. So I won't go through all of these, but they're really prompts to think about not just about care as a big topic or even equity or social and racial justices as big concerns and issues, but thinking about how do you break that down into ways uh, to actually think and practice uh, and work together in, in the work. Um, one of the um, uh, sort of power prompts of this work is that it is work that is uh, shared and together. This is an image of uh, some of us uh, 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 really just kind of having fun uh, together, but occupying different spaces. That space could be uh, your living room, right? The work of care can start uh, at different scales. Uh, it can be in spaces outside, so to other communities and the, the space of learning and exchange and, and uh, sharing practices um, uh, that can help expand uh, the community and the work in different ways. Uh, or it can be uh, strategic work. It can be, you know, getting your hands dirty, working, uh, with people and spending the time uh, and the energy to do that. This is an image of, uh, again, work in Brownsville that we were doing where a local community members are sort of articulating um, uh, their, their interests in the design of space. But one of the prompts that, that was in the 
uh, question for his talk was about kind of the future and vision and, and different approaches. And so one of the, the Black space principles is to celebrate, catalyze, and amplify Black joy. And so I wanted to share uh, sort of a tangible example of that for how it translates into built environment design. Um, so this is an image, obviously, pre-pandemic pre of uh, uh, the Dance Africa Festival, which happens in Brooklyn um, uh, in May every year uh, on Lafayette Street. And there's this wonderful kind of expression of, of uh, African and African diaspora culture that happens in this wonderful space. Uh, but there was a large redevelopment project happening in downtown Brooklyn on a city on site uh, right, right at BAM that was going to insert this huge skyscraper, uh, predominantly uh, uh, luxury but some affordable housing skyscraper. But essentially the, the idea was that that space was going to change. It was going to change radically along with the transformation of the city. And so what uh, we were thinking of during that process as there's a sort of acknowledgement that the city is changing, the city is being redesigned, it's being reconfigured, it's built environment is shifting. How and where do you sort of create the space for a community to still be uh, present, centered and valued? And that is a design process. So we had a, a significant amount of community conversations, uh, explicit outreach to, to different groups and organizations that had been connected to and using that space for a long period of time. And that became the design prompt for that space to ensure that it was designed uh, for different types of uses. So this is um, uh, Andrea Still, the architect on the project of working with uh, Ken Smith, Grain Collective, a number of different designers in creating uh, this new uh, plaza space that was going to be designed for different degrees of uh, include, but also to kind of hold and keep the space uh, for, frankly, for the Black people that have been uh, holding it for quite a long time uh, there in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, so this is a, a, a kind of photo of, of space and something that's important is that we're able to center uh, the, the, the Black people, the Black culture, uh, the ability to have a nice place to be that is public that is safe, that is comfortable uh, for uh, all different kinds of people and, and frankly for Black people, for Black culture, for Black experiences. And even though there had been a significant new investment, a significant change in that space, uh, that we were able to literally make sure that that built environment was a space that can continue to uh, hold and have Black joy uh, as its center. Now, obviously this is a public space so there are all sorts of activities that happen there, but there was a centering of uh, the, the kind of the legacy communities, the black communities uh, in determining and defining how that space would be used um, and making sure that, that those programmatic, programmatic activities could continue. Um, Shifting gears a little bit, uh, other work that I've done is very much related to what I would call community practice and thinking about what is your community, who is your community uh, and care. And so I'm from uh, Indianapolis and on, on this kind of aerial map, I've highlighted here uh, different projects that I've been working on uh, connected to housing and, and open space and the neighborhood where I grew up in Indianapolis, which is predominantly black. Uh, predominantly uh, uh, working class and middle income uh, community that had seen a lot of disinvestment uh, over years due to its sort of status as a predominantly black community. So we, uh, uh, my family and I did a project to simply say, well, how can we make our community better? Right? Uh, it's kind of a form of care, uh, the idea of, of seeing improvement. So there are a lot of buildings like this, uh, vacant uh, buildings that have been uh, uh, long, Closed to disinvestment, we simply did work to fix them up and to uh, design it in a way that provided for affordable housing. And the work of care of doing uh, that repair work was challenging, right? The, the built uh, fabric needs care, it needs reinvestment. Um, in that same community, there are a lot of vacant lots. And so there were uh, spaces like these that were just sort of uh, abandoned or, or or not kind of fully cared for and taken care of. And we did work uh, with different partners and players in the community to uh, improve those 
spaces to provide things like uh, garden spaces for food, uh, but also opportunities for expression and engagement with uh, that local uh, community. And so these are young people uh, installing this wonderful mural project. But we also have to acknowledge that there are different types of work. Uh, this is a, a concept to sort of think about care work. Uh, some people say housekeeping and you know, there are all these sort of terminologies that come up, uh, but thinking about who is doing it, how is it being done? So when we do these projects, we're thinking about our people from the neighborhood actually participating in the reinvestment and updating and upgrading of our work and projects. Uh, we're thinking about when we have the food in the gardens, do people have the tools and the access and resources they need uh, to connect with one another, but also to take full advantage of the resources that are there. Right. So I'm an, you know, I'm an architect and urban designer. And it's like, I, you know, I didn't think like canning was going to be like in my life, but, but it was sort of one of, one of the, the components of the work that was actually needed. My uh, kind of favorite project of, of that work in Indianapolis uh, is, is uh, this prompt, the, the Red Bud project. So this is an image of the Red Bud. You probably know them. They're here in New York as well. Uh, but this was an idea to think about what does care at a community scale, like really at a large scale, look like? How does it show up? What is its evidence? And so this is a type of tree that grows you know, almost like a weed. It's, it's uh, endemic. It's native to... Uh, Indianapolis. And so we thought about connecting that environmental project of care uh, needed in this neighborhood where there was a lot of disinvestment, a lot of vacancy, uh, and frankly, a loss of, of uh, urban habitat, uh, green space, tree canopy, uh, uh, kind of local uh, sort of uh, ecology uh, that had also been damaged by the social and, and racial injustices in this community. So we took vacant lots uh, uh, in the neighborhood of which there were, were very many. And we simply had this concept that the trees were going to help us take care of our space while we built capacity uh, to see improvement in our community. So this is a, you know, done at 3 a.m. Uh, quick sketch at some point in my life. Uh, this was uh, again, this sort of type of place and site that, that didn't have investment. Uh, and this is what we have today, this, this space that is being uh, cared for and, and holding these trees. Um, but what's important is that the, the site is also caring beyond its boundaries uh, for the neighborhood. So those trees that we grow on the red butt lots are uh, given away for free to people in the entire neighborhood and the entire community. And we've in fact uh, planted and given away hundreds of trees. Uh, and so what that looks like is, is something like this. This is uh, one of the neighbors uh, in that Mapleton Fall Creek neighborhood. Uh, with her family getting her uh, tree that will be planted in their yard and will soon provide shade and beauty uh, for the neighborhood. And there are, again, hundreds of these, hundreds of families uh, together making uh, that, that community. Uh, and in her hand is that contract uh, where in order to get the free tree, you'd have to promise to take care of the tree, right? It's like, it's as simple uh, as that, um, but the, the kind of the visual impact that we have in the neighborhood uh, from this collective work, right? It is sort of a collective work of art, a collective work of ecology, a collective work of design uh, based in connection communities and care. And I'll end with a, a prompt that some of you may have seen. I've had this conversation about care in the city, in, in New York City in particular. Uh, and, uh, during the Black Lives Matter protests, you probably know that there were a tremendous number of actions and actions happening in public, in public space, in the public realm, and challenging and questioning uh, what is the city for? How does it operate? Uh, where does power lie? Uh, this is an image of one of the Black Lives Matter murals uh, uh, that, that we are part of, along with the Black Lives Matter Greater New York uh, chapter to take this place on Center Street in front of the courts, uh, in front of the Civic Center and, and Mark Black Lives Matter, but doing so with Black artists, with uh, people of different uh, genders, sexuality, uh, and religious and, and belief backgrounds marking uh, the space. Sorry about this fade in, fade out, I hate that. Um, the, um, uh, the idea of, of how our public spaces are shaped and cared for 
uh, was quite important uh, in this transition during protests, during uh, the COVID pandemic and people uh, returning and, and thinking about the caring of, of their public spaces in different and new ways uh, and with different uh, ideas about publicness and economy. And so thinking about that um, uh, work, there's the idea that the government itself may need to adapt and that there may need to be a prompt of, of thinking about care within our structures of government and designing and controlling the space uh, in ways that can create new possibilities and occupations of space. This is a wonderful event, a uh, pandemic era event uh, by Harlem uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs and creatives uh, to take over kind of a plaza space and to make it one that is uh, of collectivity uh, and, and shared space for the community and being imaginative about what that might be. Uh, for example, this sort of uh, roller rink uh, installed and, and just seeing people enjoying each other, caring for each other, uh, health and socially. Um, and with that, I think that is all. Hi, thank you so much, Justin. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Deanna. Uh, I'll just read the bio real quick and we'll jump right into it. Uh, Deanna Van Buren is the co-founder and executive director of Designing Justice plus Designing Spaces, an architect, excuse me, an architecture and real estate nonprofit working to end mass incarceration through place-based solutions, DJDS, builds an infrastructure that addresses the root causes, poverty, racism, unequal access to resources, and the criminal justice system itself. She has been profiled by the New York Times and her TED talk on what a world without prisons could look like has been viewed more than a million times. Van Buren received her MR at Columbia University and is an alumna of the low, sorry, I don't, one of for outside Love Fellowship at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Um, and without further ado, please take it away. Thanks, Jared. Thank you all for inviting me. It's also just great to see what Justin's doing, get to catch up with Justin, who I never get to see. So that's awesome. Uh, also, if you guys are willing and able, I would love to see your faces. I know you've been on Zoom all day. I feel cared for when I can see the beautiful faces of who I'm talking to. So I will just uh, share that need for my own personal care. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to talk about care within the context of the criminal justice system. Um, and I want to show some emerging stuff that we're doing, because I think there's some exciting stuff happening that people need to know about. So when we talk about abolishing prisons and people freak out, like, there's no way. I'm like, no, we can really do this. And it's actually happening. And you know, if, if there is a system that does not care for black and brown bodies on the planet, it's our system of mass incarceration, right? I mean, it is uh, the opposite of care, it's torture. And it's really a the imagination, right? And the, the root cause and the legacies of enslavement, you know, when one in three black men can find themselves incarcerated in their lifetime, we have a real problem uh, and it has to be addressed. And it's not going to be addressed by designing prettier versions of things. That's not the, the care the care angle we got to take, right? Because if it's rooted in enslavement, a pretty box isn't going to cut it. So, you know, as we start to look at the role that we play, right, when we look at this architecture, it's not architecture of care, right? You can sort of see this architecture of surveillance, of punishment, of security, of oppression, uh, of separation, right, really playing out in the built environment. And, and, and this includes both incarceration and adjudication, right, courthouses, police stations, detention centers, the full ecosystem. And so the question that we, we face is, you know, if we're not going to do this, what do we do? Because you can't come in and say, oh, we're not going to, to build prisons and jails and have no solution. And what's the beautiful thing about designers is that we are solutionary, right? We, we, we are tasked with that. We have the gift for that. And so a lot of what we've done, it was so great to see Black Spaces work, right? The same similar ethos and, and thinking that you've got to talk to folks who are closest to the problem. You have to talk to the folks who are at the margins, bring them into the center. And that our, the work that we do as designers 
can it really shift our brain chemistry actually, right? We move into elastic thinking, we can ignite imagination and that's is what's really required. And therefore I say our role is critical for social change, right? It's critical if we wanna shift from a system of punishment to a system of, of care. And so what I'll show is some of uh, these examples, right? We believe that over the years as we've engaged hundreds and hundreds, now thousands of people to think about this, that this is the ecosystem we need to end this, this, this system, right? Spaces for diversion and entry, restorative reinvestments in communities, spaces for youth, spaces for survivors of severe violence, uh, specialized housing, spaces for behavioral health and, and specialized spaces for education. So I won't show all the spaces, but I do wanna show sort of, a, I'll call it the large, medium, small uh, approach of projects that I think are beginning to, to show us that we are actually at this shift in time. And I'll, I like to start with the large one and then we'll talk about the little by the time we get to the end. So I don't know if you all know about this. In LA County, I, I'm telling you, they are the by far doing the most progressive social change work around this issue that I've ever seen. And right before the pandemic, the uh, LA County Board of Supervisors approved something called the Alternatives to Incarceration Implementation Plan. This plan outlined hundreds of strategies that they needed to execute to shift from uh, the use of jails, because they had the largest jail system in the world in LA County, to a system of care. So this was approved by the county supervisors and is now being implemented. And we've been fortunate enough to be part of that implementation strategy as we start to look at creation of a holistic uh, system of care and what do those places and spaces look like. So there are a couple projects and initiatives that we have started, right? So it's super early but I think it's worth talking about and knowing about. One of the projects that we've been working on is in downtown LA, and it was intended to be one of the first pilots, right? So what, what happens when we start to look at large systemic change, right? We're looking at a massive county, is that a lot of people are up here trying to figure it out, but what you need at the same time is a micro macro approach. So actual pilot projects that can happen at the same time as the system change is happening, so you can really anchor it and ground it. And so this is one of those projects that we've been working on to do that. It's in downtown LA near what you all may be familiar with is our justice core, right? Every city's got one, that nasty little hole in the donut that is like a space of adjudication, incarceration. It's got bail bondsmen. There's no housing there. There's nothing to eat. You know, it, it's, a, it's dead at night, right? Everyone's got them and they're dying, right? They're dying all over the country, which is good news, but what do we do with them? And how do we catalyze new things? So we have, you know, the Justice Corps in downtown LA next to a, an, a shelter for unhoused folks, next to Homeboy Industries that's supporting folks coming home, Chinatown residents, uh, Mexican Americans from, uh, you know, historically on Olvera Street, and then Union Station, which is a major transportation hub. And then this huge uh, foundation called the California Endowment, right? They, they, fund, they have like a billion dollar fund. They fund uh, nonprofits all over California. They have a piece of land that they were like, hey, we want you all to come in, do a community engage process and think about this, both a process and a product as a prototype for what uh, some of these new spaces would look like. So we worked with Quanke Design Initiative. So if you all know those landscape architects out of LA uh, to do a lot of community engagement very quickly, right? So we were doing 11 workshops. We were giving packets because it was COVID, sending things home to folks. Uh, we were doing stakeholder interviews. We did site activations on site, masked. Uh, we were engaging with uh, the California Endowment themselves. And we're able to come back to them after we coded and analyzed all that we heard to begin to say, well, what this place needs to have. And we've seen this so many times, right? Spaces that care for us are not siloed uses, right? So, oh, we have this, then there's this, this is where I get my social services. But that it's really a collection of spaces uh, that meet all the needs we have as human beings, right? And look at the populations we're addressing. We're trying to focus on folks, uh, systems impacted folks coming home. We have unhoused folks who also have to gather and play and, and be here. We have Chinatown residents coming here. So there were a lot of folks that needed to weigh in. And this was what they told us they needed, right? They needed a place to gather and to be together. Uh, they needed a place, particularly with systems impacted folks, we find a lot, they need a place where they need jobs, you know, they need work, they need workforce training, and that that was an essential piece of what had to happen there. 
We also started to sort of address the sort of social service things really is about the mind, body, and the spirit, caring for those parts of ourselves. You know, everything from meditation and wellness space to a place where the unhoused residents could wash their clothes, a computer lab, a clinic, right? That these are centers where folks can really come and get the needs they, they need for, for their whole being, right? Their holistic being. And then also excitingly enough, people want to be able to make stuff, right? The creation of music. We see this a lot in the projects that arts and culture is essential in terms of how we care for our communities and it's finding its way into every project that we do. And then a housing component. In this case, transitional supportive housing for folks coming home. And I'll show another prototype for that that we're working on later. This is a critical essential issue for reentry, and you'll see the conditions in a minute of what folks are actually living in, but the idea that we would combine these, these hubs with an affordable housing component. Adriana Barcenas was the design lead on this. She's on this call and she's mad at me right now because I have a fuzzy site plan, so she can yell at me later. But the, you can see what I'm talking about, that, that what's happened is we've gathered the hubs, right? And around a sort of series of outdoor spaces, the other piece that the um, communities said they wanted was a lot of outdoor space. So we've only taken up 50% of the site with the architecture, leaving the rest open with green space, including the roofscape. And that there's a sort of idea that this piece is spinning around what we're calling ecotones, right? Hubs of spaces where all the hubs and people are, can mix both programmatically and, and personally, right? So that there's in a sense, an idea that this is a village, right? This is a village comprised of these different pieces where everyone can come and come together. So this is really new work where we've, I don't even think we presented this to the California Endowment Board yet, but you know, this is a $150 million investment in a project that can then be replicated throughout the county and people can start to see this is how you need to engage folks in creation of these new spaces uh, and how those sort of public-private partnerships begin to work. Because we also at DJDS are looking at financing and real estate and advising folks on both ends of that spectrum. So the second piece that's happening, this is happening at the same time. LA County is really killing it, right? So they also are trying to end youth incarceration, right? These two systems are often different, right? We incarcerate our young people in a separate kind of context uh, versus adults, and that cutoff point uh, varies. So they've also created the Youth Justice Reimagined Initiative. Uh, the state of California has ended youth incarceration at the state level, so young people are coming back to the county. LA County says we don't want it, we shouldn't be incarcerating young people, and they created a whole set of new infrastructure that needed to be created to not do that. Two of them are 24-hour youth and family centers and safe and secure healing centers. So we're advising the county on the development of these two centers, looking at examples all over the country, including some in New York. And then at the same time, starting an initiative that is DJDS led for a, a sort of a youth uh, behavioral health, holistic health hub that actually begins to create a pilot for both of those initiatives, both the alternatives to incarceration piece and the youth justice reimagined. This project's going to be in Long Beach this is an unusual role that an architect can play, right? Where we're created a concept paper, we're out ahead of the system, creating a concept for an idea, building out the partners, building out the program participants, doing the community engagement, and then also figuring out how is the real estate gonna work and then the design follows suit. But in the meantime, sharing that with all the work we've been doing with young folks, with all the work we've been doing with Systems Impacted, we know we, you can't silo the care, right? You've got to have these things together in one place and truly address the behavioral, mental, and physical health of people, right? And so we talk to them about, here's a process, right? This is the process. We have to build relationships. We're going to look at uh, alignment with local policy. We're going to do data and prep. We're going to collect that information. We're going to iterate on the concept. And we're creating a whole uh, program called The Hive, where we're going to be training local community members on, members on how to do this work themselves, right? So this train the trainer piece has become part of our process where we leave behind our knowledge in the community, let them lead the community engagement. Uh, the concept paper also has this incredible uh, graphic, uh, um, uh, I'll call it a cartoon, but illustration that really was us talking to systems impacted youth in illustrating their experience through the system, right? So when you go to look at the concept paper, we don't have architecture yet, right? But what we do have is story and narrative and how can design at other levels early on ignite both funding, 
our fundraising for this is going well. And we are going to be able to sort of initiate something while the county's like, oh, what do we do? What's the policy? What's the program? We're like, no, honey, we just got to make a thing. We got to make some stuff. So that's kind of where I feel like our role is shifting a lot as designers and architects and planners. We could really be out front and really take the lead. So I'll, I'll show a medium one, but I realize I have to reshare because I did not share my sound. So, um, the medium one, it's not really medium. It feels really large. You might think it's really small, but I'm going to share it all the same. So the pop-up village, and I think uh, Justin showed some of these strategies, right? Like how do we activate blighted space? And this was a project we started a long time ago. You know, what would it look like to create a village on wheels that moved around and activated different spaces throughout uh, the Bay Area uh, with an access to all sorts of resources. So I'll just show this video. If you can't hear it, let me know. You should be able to hear it though. village and what's kind of cool about the village is that it can it can be whatever you need it to be so what's happened during the pandemic is we've started to work with um, the University of California San Francisco's OBGYN to create what we call the pop-up pregnancy village uh, you know the the stats for black women black and brown women in this country around preterm birth is is shocking right it's embarrassing that we we, we have cannot support uh, young black mothers. Uh, to deliver healthy babies. And a lot of that has to do with the structural racism of the medical industry. That's a whole other talk. We won't get into that today. But what they were noticed when they talked to women, like, we just need services in our community. Like, I want to go to the hospital. I want to deal with you guys. So when they found the pop-up village, it was a good marriage for us to be able to come together and modify the village so that this would be a place where women could get access to resources. So to date, We've served about 225 pregnant mamas and their families on site. We take up about a city block with this. We have about 20 different types of vendors providing everything. We have doulas out there. You can hang from the tree and practice birthing. Like it's all the thing and the massage and the haircut and the DJ. And we've got exercise classes, all kinds of stuff that's happening on site. We just had one this past Saturday and more and more women are coming, right? What we realized is you have to pop up in the same place over and over again so to build trust, right? I think Jess was talking about, we gotta go with the speed of trust, it takes time. And so we're now after popping up since last year, starting to see that all during the pandemic, which is actually, it's a better, safer way to get access to resources because we're outside and people can feel a little safer, right, to be able to do that. And this is an ongoing project that we're actually looking to spin off from our organization and create its own company um, because it's, a, it's not medium at all. It's actually so big. Um, and, you know, we're doing evaluation. And I think as an organization, we're committed, like, is our, are our projects doing what we say that they want to do? To date, we, you know, we we're learning that the pop-up has supported community cohesion, which is truly what keeps us safe and cared for. Access to resources has been increased for communities and also looking at how it can generate revenue for local entrepreneurs. So the last piece I'll show are a couple small projects. Um, and just because they're small doesn't mean they're not powerful and equally as important. Uh, one piece that we've been working on is in response to this condition. I don't know if you guys know what this is, but this is what reentry housing looks like, right? I've been incarcerated for 20, 30, 40 years. I come out, this is where I get to go. Uh, I can sometimes be in these spaces for six months to two years. Um, it's mandated often by the state. And these are not either safe nor caring environments for folks who are already suffering from PTSD and trying to cover over literally thousands of hurdles to successful reentry and, and avoid recidivism. So 
we started to work with black churches around creating grand tree housing and in doing so started to realize the issue and we began to work with systems impacted men and women around the creation of something called a mobile refuge room often you know the cost of construction particularly in the bay area and of course new york is exorbitant and what could we do whoops uh, to create a, a space that would provide dignity and privacy for folks coming home and we did full scale mock ups with at a local community college with systems impacted folks uh, who are in a special program there. We work with Laney colleges. Um, uh, they had a fab lab. So the same students learned how to do digital fabrication. They fabricated uh, and got living wage job skills while they built the prototype. And we had the beta put into the field. It's going well. Uh, and we are now looking to pilot this. So we have the patent is done, right? So we own this, which is great. Um, and beginning to find an operator. Now COVID kind of stalled this, right? Because they now started to put folks in hotels. But we are now moving into a space where these are possible again, and we'll be exhibiting it this week in LA and talking to program providers who can begin to implement this in, in the field as a way to provide real dignity and privacy at about a quarter of the cost of building out a full room. So the second small piece, right, I, you may not know what this is, it says prosecutor's office, but what it represents is spaces for survivors, right? So if you're a survivor of homicide, or you're a survivor of some kind of severe violence, guess what, you're in the system and now you get re-victimized. We have no spaces for survivors, people who have survived all kinds of trauma that we can't possibly imagine, and some of us can. And so a lot of the work we've been working on in the last year or so is the development using um, institutional review board, right? So this is IRB research uh, that has been approved by that board to begin to understand what the qualities and needs and spaces of spaces for survivors need to be across the spectrum. So one piece that we started working on was like once, if you have a loved one who's been killed, uh, you're coming into the prosecutor's office and this is a gray area for us. We don't normally work within the system, but this was a, a moment where we decided we really needed to step in. And we began to do virtual design workshops with victims advocates, survivors themselves, uh, the prosecutors themselves, to begin to understand what environments actually needed to be created to make people feel cared for, to make them feel calm, et cetera. What feelings did they even want it to elicit? Uh, we did not just design workshops, we created visual surveys. Uh, we coded and analyzed that data very rigorously. This is very rigorous research that we've done. And we started to see that, you know, people want to feel calm. They need to feel a sense of trust. They need to feel safe in these environments. Uh, and we began to take that space just as a model and began to look at what those environments needed to look like. We needed to have objects of comfort. You needed to have choice of spaces to sit. You needed to have uh, um, uh, representations of nature, access to light, views, a huge range of things that needed to be included in the environment so that people could feel those things. These images and all this research is part of a toolkit that was uh, distributed by the Center for Court Innovation nationally as a toolkit for folks to use within these contexts. But we weren't satisfied, we just, we've, we've continued, like there just more research needs to be done. So we started to work with Common Justice out of New York. Common Justice is one of the leading uh, restorative justice programs in the country. They are addressing uh, cases of severe violence using restorative justice. So when people say you can't use restorative justice for that, it's not true, it's happening. We know that 95% of survivors of severe violence prefer restorative justice. And so what's happening is you have what they call responsible parties and harmed parties coming together to have a dialogue about what happened and address the offender's conduct. And so for us, we did the same strategies with Common Justice that we did with Essex. Again, particularly hearing from staff about wanting to feel cared for by their space and not feeling cared for by it. And it looks like a regular institution. And I can tell you this is common because because our larger society has no exposure to design and the built environment and understanding that they don't care about it. And they, they don't care about it, not innately, they don't care about it because it's just not something they ever thought was relevant. Right? We often hear people say like, well, what do you think about your spaces now? They're like, oh, it's okay, right? And it's really not okay. But they don't, haven't even been sensitized and aware to the impact the space is actually having on their nervous system. 
So once we start to show and talk about it, they actually really know what they need. And it becomes uh, essential. I mean, the, the director of common uh, justice was someone I've been bugging forever about this. And she finally broke down during COVID and said, you know, you're right. The environment has to change. And so using all those same means and methods, and this will be part of our data set, starting to talk about how to create a sort of uh, central heart of nature into the space. This was their preferred strategy uh, coming in. And we needing to understand how to lay out space for when you have parties coming into conflict, they need different routes, they need to follow different paths. And the real constellation of spaces is very sensitive about how it gets laid out. So really starting to learn about that and how we create spaces for restorative justice as a new typology, rather than courthouses, rather than prisons and jails that we need to be developing and building out. So I'm super excited about this research. We will be publishing this year. And my hope it's really going to ignite a, a kind of larger consciousness to a shift to doing justice this way. This will include all of the guidelines and concepts that need to go with that from what we've learned. We've been doing this a long time, but this is the first time we've done some really, really uh, rigorous uh, research. So, you know, the, the idea is that if we think it's possible, it is, right? If we can shift our mindset from punishment to care, or if I always like to think care and love are related, right? Like we love ourselves, we love our community. If we shift that mindset, that justice could be like that, it can be. It really can be. And it's happening. And this is the shift that I think we're advocating for um, system-wide. So thank you all. You can see everybody. Look at that. Like, I feel so much better. I can't tell you. I like, I love seeing people. Thank you. That was amazing. And we have our final prospect, um, Chandra. So Chandra Christmas Roos works to reimagine and redesign space, including physical, social, and virtual to make sites more sustainable, just and climate resilient. As a program officer at Enterprise Community Partners, she develops program, policy, and capital initiatives with local partners that focus on environmental resilience, equitable transit-oriented development, ETOD, and healing center engagement. A background in community development and environmental justice informs her design approach of working with community stakeholders in a participatory process to support capacity building and achieve place-based solutions to reimagine systems. So can you please go? Chandra. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so I first just want to thank Jared and the Pratt Futures team for the invitation and to the two panelists. I deeply admire your work. So excited to be in conversation with you all and to everyone listening in. Um, thanks for caring about these issues. Thanks for showing up and um, just excited for our discussion later. And so uh, the title of my presentation tonight is A Map to Whose We Are. And the question that I want you all to hold during my presentation is how can we create more ease? And I'm gonna come back to that throughout, um, throughout this story. And just wanted to start off this conversation with um, just more about myself and, and what has informed this work, and then talk about a definition of care that's informed by my research on black feminist space making, and then lift up a project about how I put that definition um, into practice. And so uh, growing up, my favorite birthday parties to, grow, to go to were other people's birthday parties. I really appreciated folks that came out and wanted to celebrate me, but I never liked having my own birthday parties. I didn't like making sure everyone was having fun or everyone staring at me. And so uh, it was different when I was at my grandmother's house, who is in this image here. Um, I called my grandmother Nana, and I loved these birthday parties. We used to look at photo albums together of her and my mom as a kid and me as a smaller kid, so I always would feel super seen. We would bake a cake together from scratch, and I never ate it because I told her I didn't like sweet things, so I always felt heard. And I loved these birthday parties because they reminded us to remember. They were ceremonies and I always felt held. 
And particularly, it made me remember that I wasn't an individual and that my life wasn't scarce because my life wasn't even mine. All of the photo albums of ancestors, both present and future ancestors that we looked at told me that. All the birthday cakes that we made together and then gave away told me that. All these ceremonies we had just called that we be present for what this moment is teaching us. And for me, the lesson was that my Nana was a space maker. She made space for the ceremonies that she and I needed. And years later, I carry these lessons of space making with me. And as an urban planner, I continue the work of remembering in Black space. So in my research, I wanted to understand uh, what space making means for folks across the scale of the city, how its offerings differ from place making, and what the field of urban planning could learn from it. And so after my first year of grad school, I traveled to Chicago for the first time to do an internship. And I would often see this sign and like many others, I thought that the retrofitting of America's urban landscapes offer a major opportunity, but this sign left me with questions like, whose neighborhoods are considered modern? Who are these jobs for? Do they have livable wages? What do we mean by our future? And most importantly, what does it mean to build a new Chicago? And who's considered old Chicago? I would also see images like this when I was in Chicago. So this is from Chicago-based artist Jamila Woods and her music video, Giovanni. And I became enthralled by this image. The model of downtown Chicago is familiar. The person staring back at me was familiar, Jamila, but the positionality of the two was not familiar. Jamila was holding the city, but was it a loving embrace? Were she and the city wrestling? In that moment, the city was no longer a city. It was another being. It was a being that was loved and cared for enough to be reimagined. And that's all that mattered to me. Her lyrics from her album, Heaven, and the visuals pushed me to reimagine what a Black woman's relationship to the city could be. I saw the ways that she and so many other Black women creatives were reimagining the city through space-making practices. I saw this disjuncture between the rhetoric of planning uh, evidenced in the sign that the Department of Planning had and the language and imaginaries of these women and other Black women creative practitioners. And I could clearly see the material and um, conceptual and imaginative maps that they, they were making in extraordinary ways. But why wasn't this a part of our collective understanding of urban planning? And I wanted to address this disconnect. So what is space making? So space making refers to the production of three notions of space that I explore in my research. The first is experiential. So this is about physical space. These are the spatial practices, meaning the everyday routines and experiences that create uh, social spaces. Um, so the example that you see here is from a collective called Party Noir, which is an inclusive cultural hub celebrating Black femmes, queer women of color, and Black women across the gender spectrum through parties and events across the city of Chicago. The second is around perception. So these are the representations of space, meaning the understandings contained in plans, codes, designs. This is about how we conceptualize space. And the example that you see here is from a project entitled Color Theory by artist and architect Amanda Williams, in which she painted, uh, repainted and photographed eight vacant condemned houses uh, in the neighborhood of Englewood in Chicago, usually using a culturally charged color palette, drawing attention to the ways uh, that power shapes our investment in the city, particularly in black and brown communities. And the last form of space making is about imagination. So these are representational spaces, meaning the ways uh, and spaces of imagination through which life is directly lived. And the example you see here is from the cover of writer Eve Ewing's poetry book called Electric Arches which is an imaginative exploration of black girlhood and womanhood through poetry, visual art, and narrative set in the 1990s um, in, in Chicago. And so then how does that form of space making that I went over differ from place making? 
So writer Catherine McKittrick often writes about how Black women's matters are spatial matters. And that idea that Black women's lives are necessarily spatial, but also struggle with discourses that are race and despatialize the unique and distinct knowledge that is born from lived experience navigating the city. It is this idea that I begin to conceptualize space making versus place making. So the question is, how are we designing spaces that allow you to show up beyond this moment or this intersection or this time, um, but rather how do you show up across the city in this body as this being? And uh, as a part of this work, I wanted to specifically understand Black feminist space making. And so I interviewed uh, seven Black women creatives across the city. And these women in particular were conjuring possibilities of belonging beyond survival. And they were illustrating how a sense of care can be collective. And I just wanted to show the first um, minute or so of a video collage that I put together from those interviews to show the definition of care through the built environment that um, I heard so clearly distilled from those interviews and this research. But all of the traditional institute art institutions, I ain't never felt comfortable. I never, yeah, in this way, I am such a very typical Black kid from the South Side. Like, I, I grew up knowing I was interested in art, but we did not access those places to fulfill our artistic desires. That was not where it was happening. It was like, no, nah, we, we create spaces. Like, this little spot, Lit X, that opened up in Wicker Park. Like, we, gonna go, we all going to go there. This little club. Like, we created space. We did not. Yeah, museums. So now that I'm, now that I'm in these spaces speaking, <laughs> Um, it's still very weird for me. So just wanted to highlight the beginning of that, and I invite you all to check out the rest, but um, wanted to lift up three takeaways from uh, this research and how it has informed a definition of care through the built environment for me. And so the first is around embodied spaces. And these three takeaways are in the form of questions and invite you all to, to have a dialogue with them and explore what they mean for you. So embodied space, the, the question is, what would your city be like if you felt your city as a space, as a community centered um, and included Black women? And so embodied space is about more than a set of social relations. It's about creating space for your entire selves to show up in. And so this means that all parts of your identity are welcomed, affirmed, and embraced. It's about a feeling of reciprocity of both love and care. It, it feels at ease and it, and it feels like home and just asks you to, to be present. And so these themes would often come up around what embodied space meant. The next is around spatial agency. And the question here is what if when we dwell in the imaginative space, our space gave us all the resources we need to manifest our collective vision? And so a lot of the, the work and space making practices that uh, we explored were educating as much as they were building capacity for latent genius to thrive in the neighborhoods. And so this is about the belief that genius already exists and it's about meeting that with opportunity. It both lives in the abundance of possibilities, but also the clarity and the affirmation of the assets that, that are already within uh, neighborhoods. And the last one is around legible and legitimate poetics. And the question is, if these women are credible planners, how can their work be amplified? How can they be incorporated into dominant uh, planning culture as equal and valued practitioners and contributors to the field? And so uh, poetics that I use in this research refers to a spatial language that's rooted 
in art uh, and expression of culture. And so at its core, this research was a legibility and legitimacy project in urban planning within a broader socio-political and historical context. Uh, my purpose was both to write the history of Black feminist space making into the history of urban planning, um, but also to make their, their practices legible while using the rhetoric of planning and introducing uh, new terms and, and new possibilities that their work opened up. And so wanted to, to think more about language and, and how that can evolve along with these practices that we introduce. And so next wanted to highlight uh, a project that I'm working on now with my team at Enterprise that really puts this definition into practice um, into the form of a framework entitled the Healing Centered Community Development Framework. And so Healing Centered was, uh, it was a term coined by Dr. Sean Jenright and it recognizes that to heal from collective traumas, we must take collective approaches. So while healing informed hones in on trauma, and sometimes people can then be defined by those experiences and by their trauma, whereas healing defined by its assets can be leveraged from a person's full lived experience and focuses on the possibilities. If we understand that trauma can be passed down through generations, we believe that healing can as well. This is about how healing must come first before we begin to design and serve for communities. So this particular framework that my team and I are working on serves as an invitation. It encompasses plans of actions, personal practices, collective organizing tools, all of which account for healing as a critical process in repairing and restoring the relationships that are necessary for equitable community development. And to be clear, the purpose of this framework is to not pick it up and, and read it and then be able to hear your be able to heal yourself, but instead the purpose is really focused on creating systems and structures that do not interfere with our abilities to heal ourselves and others. It's about being in relationship with people and how that can feel good. So first wanted to walk through the principles that ground this framework. So these principles articulate the norms and expectations around how an organization group and community will operate into the future and provides guidance on how everyone within that can contribute through the decisions that they make and the actions that they take. So it begins with what we protect. We really focus on holistic well-being, being a universal right, and how all forms of design can help to protect that. What we value is cultural assets and believe that has sustained generations of past and generations to come. So that's a huge part of our resilience. We do our work by prioritizing process, facilitating trust building, and centering Blackness and indigeneity in how we work um, always. So this is an important part of how we approach our work uh, as community development practitioners. We measure our work by relationships. So this is how are we getting in better relationship with ourselves? So beginning with that awareness of what's getting in our own way with the land, as we heard through the land acknowledgement at the beginning, and with the communities. Um, so thinking about this as, as a process of how we then move to uh, build, being in better relationship with community. And the end goal um, is always toward more healing and more liberation than, than we have today. And so that's always kind of how we anchor our work and where we're moving with this work. Our strategies take us a little deeper into how we apply these healing center principles. These are the choices we make. So beginning with reflection. So a lot of our workshops are really anchored in how are we building more of a self-awareness and acknowledging both past injustice, current injustice, in order to make different decisions in the future. We also talk about involving. So who are we bringing with us and how are we amplifying the assets that exist within communities and honoring that strength? Restore, this really focuses on how we're creating both internal and external spaces for healing. And then invest, this is looking at all the different forms of power that we have and to not move away from power to exist, to acknowledge that it is always there, but it is how we build it and who we build it with. And then lastly, reimagination. So how are we getting creative with what these solutions look like and, and advancing liberation with this work? 
And then lastly, just wanted to share one of the tools that we that we um, work on with this particular framework. So this is a screen that we might use with uh, affordable housing developers, for example, to assess their project and to think about how are they embedding these strategies and principles um, into this work. And so these prompts take folks more deeply into the types of design decisions and process decisions that they'll have an opportunity to make. And within each of these questions are more questions that align with the core principles and can guide you uh, through this journey of centering healing and liberation. And so excited to, to talk more about what types of tools we can uh, use in this work. And just to close, wanted to return back to this question that I offered in the beginning of how can we create more ease? And so uh, I invite you all to just take a moment and jot down what that looks like for you. It could be ease for yourself, ease for others um, as we move into the, the Q&A. So thank you all. That was amazing, Chandra. Thank you all for your presentations. And so we're going to start it off. Perhaps you're just going to start off the questionnaire. We see we did get a couple in the chat. Um, if anybody has any, they can raise their hand throughout so we can kind of make it an open dialogue. That would be best. Um, or if you have any statements, ideas, um, you can put them in the chat. We'll say them for you if you don't want to say them yourself. But something to note that we seen between each um, project, you know, each of you have documents and these various manifestos, these initiatives, but um, it's kind of, I guess, disheartening to see that you have to build trust first sometimes. And that kind of begins to speak to how deep the trust is to get the, to be able to begin to make these spaces for these people. You know, what does that mean for them to be able to become vulnerable in these spaces? to even participate and accept these kind of whole self to bring in these gathering spaces. And it seems that there's a yearning for collective gathering. And so I understand we keep using the word care and everything, but from what has been published out of, you know, y'all documents, y'all projects, um, how do you understand care really? How do you understand care for yourself and when you bring yourself to these projects? Does this come, you know, come from experience I know y'all shared some of that um, introspection, um, introspection from project maybe you've seen, you know, safely building. And then the second part is how do you begin to start articulating that care as far as design process? And I guess for yourself, because we saw a couple of ecological, geographical, as well as socioeconomic factors that heavily weigh into what becomes care for these certain projects. Um, and I guess where I feel strongly wants to start. No. Oh, well, I'll jump in and say that um, part of what brought me kind of personally into this um, work or kind of thinking and framework is that uh, so much of my grounding or sort of early awareness of design and built environment were defined by a lack of care, right? A lack of investment, a lack of all these different things. And even as a kid, you sort of go around and as your world gets sort of progressively larger and you see other spaces and other environments, you start to see the differences uh, that, that exist. Uh, and, and very often uh, uh, the sort of presence or lack of presence of, of care become quite, quite legible. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I migrated into the you know, the urban and public side of things. So a lot of conversations about public spaces, uh, shared um, uh, common infrastructures, et cetera, were, were quite important. And, and that idea of kind of uh, social environmental difference were, were just very legible to me, right? And, and thinking and seeing that design and design or urbanist um, practices were somehow uh, meant to address the, those things. Um, so that's sort of a, kind of a, a, a personal perspective, but the more that you uh, move around, do this work, especially work that's quote unquote community or, or uh, somehow 
public facing and you have conversations with people over time, those are the things that show up, right? And, and there's some like translation work, right? So someone might be talking about, uh, you know, rats, for example. But if you go behind, like what's behind the rats, there are a lot of, of different uh, layers of environment, of policy, of investment that, that are contributing to things that people are experiencing directly. And so the, the, the complexity of, of all of those things is how I see and kind of perceive these definitions of care or understandings of care is to see the many different uh, types of work or the types of systems that are shaping what people are, are experiencing, what they have access to or not. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll say in this, I was trying to uh, get across in my presentation was this idea of the collectivity uh, and where and how that's working being something that is, is actually primary uh, in our approach. And in, in design, built environment and planning, there's like the concept of expertise or quote unquote best practice or some form of knowledge uh, that, you know, in theory you learn it and then you apply that knowledge uh, somewhere. Um, Things are more complicated than, than that, uh, and, and especially in um, different resource environments. And so the work of, of thinking about how things are done collectively um, and what types of communication are needed to do that, what types of trust are needed to do that uh, is something that I think is really important and uh, uh, practices a a designer to be thinking about and, and centering. Um, you know, all those years that I worked in, in the, the city government, uh, you know, that's like the ultimate collective is a city, right? Like the you know, 300,000 people work for the city of New York. So those of you who are in New York City, New York City government is 300,000 people, right? You may know the institution and all the agencies and elected officials, but the whole thing is actually this big, very complex, collective effort uh, that's trying to make all of us function together somehow in the same space, right? That's, that's fundamentally what it's doing. And there are failures in those collectives around communication and around trust and around understanding that, that have major, major impacts. We saw that with the, the Bronx fire recently, right? That's, that's evidence of a lack of, of communication and understanding and care kind of at a systemic level. All the people in government, right, from the fire department, the housing department, no one wanted that to happen, right? So it, but there are these, these disconnects that, that we have to understand uh, to, to do our work and to be more uh, effective, I, I think, is, is kind of people trying to work together to, to see better out. share a little bit uh, on that. I think that, uh, like what Justin said, it was the lack of care that ignited that. And, you know, just personally, I had to start caring for myself first before I could, I mean, I had to do my self-care, my self-work. For a, a decade, I was really focused on healing myself and undoing the belief structures and, and, and ideas about my own value and what I deserve for me to even to be able to begin to do the work in community uh, that I do. And in, in doing so in that time, I, I always said, I was like, I don't think there is a more powerful and obvious representation of who we care about and who we don't care about than the built environment. I mean, you, you all know what I'm talking about. It's just in your face. And it's powerful because it lasts a long time and the harm that it can do folks over time is intense. So I, I think, you know, space can love you, right? Space can care for you and it, and it should, but uh, we, the things that are our beliefs that are happening inside of us about who has value and who doesn't manifest in the built environment to disastrous effects and it amplifies and ricochets on itself, right? So as someone who had been on my own self-care journey, 
And then like, well, what do I, I'm an architect. I, I don't know how to do nothing else is all I've ever done is what I'm supposed to be doing. What is my role here in ensuring that the built environment does care for, for folks like us? Um, and that it is that it matters. Like it really matters what we put and plant in the ground, where we put things, right? What materials we use, um, the way that it's it's scaled and structured and formalized, and the fact that it's innate, and that in in talking to communities that have never met an architect, I can't tell. I mean, I'm sure you've had this. Like, you'll know a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant. You never met, you never worked with an architect before, but why? Why, when the built environment has such a tremendous impact on us, on us? And so, beginning to share with people and in the process of engaging folks is a way of caring for them so that they even understand that the built environment is impacting them and it matters. And they have a voice and a role to play in transforming it so that the inner world, right, the inner love we, we need to grow and build for ourselves is reflected in the, the physical world around us. You know, if you're having a nasty day, if you're depressed, things are going bad, but you're a million bucks, your, your apartment doesn't look so great, right? It's so quick and it's so direct. Um, you can tell what kind of emotional space I am by looking at what my apartment looks like, right? So it's simple, just a simple example, but uh, it, space matters in that way. I just wanted to pick up on the the last point that I was making in my presentation. So the reason I wanted to to frame uh, my remarks around that question of how do we create more ease is that I asked my mom while she was um, recovering from a hip replacement surgery um, how I could care for her and and what care means to her. And she said ease. Like she kind of kept coming back to that word. And I think for me, as I, as I mentioned, my work is about remembering and that, that is something I think I need to remember. Um, and, and I think kind of discerning what, what is my work is, is, um, is what I need to remember. So I take that with me as I think about my definition of care and, and how I start to understand care and then um, being able to articulate it through practices and being disciplined about it. And so it's about how I start meetings. It's about how I start friendships. It's about um, how I begin new hobbies, like, you know, thinking where I can start to embed that into any beginning and, and make that into um, a possibility for more ease uh, in my life. Thank you all for each of those answers, touching on a lot of topics that we hopefully can get from um, some of the submitted questions. Before I move on to the next um, question, I wanted to invite, if anyone feels comfortable, um, to just put in the chat what their response to that um, question of ease was. I'd love to see what everyone thought, um, if you feel comfortable. But um, to one of the comments in the chat uh, spoke about um, the stopping of activism. And that reminded me of one of the questions as well as some of my personal experiences where last year I was living in Houston and we underwent a big freeze and our power grid failed us. But during that time, I saw mutual aid networks blossom that I'd never seen before. It's so strong and you know potent. Um, but that goes to the point that often these great displays of care are after major events. And while this is great, often these networks seem to lie or to die down afterwards or at least lose visibility. So I guess one question would be, what are some alternative ways of approaching care rather than reaction in the moment um, being more forth, uh, preventative or how can we respond and embed this into our um, practices so it's not like this? Um, and then how can we better maintain these networks and support those who do this work? Um, and again, anyone can uh, jump in when they want, but yeah. And please continue to leave comments and questions down below. Um, so for me, when I hear that question, I think about how in a state of emergency, everything feels really urgent. And I think it's important that we be honest with ourselves and with our communities about 
what what feels urgent like what do we feel like we need um and before kind of these these major events happen so i think everyone kind of has a a need or um whether that's accessibility or um healing that that feels urgent and i think it's important to, to understand what that looks like for everyone um and not just name it as the emergency but but whatever feels urgent for you Yeah, I um, it's a it's a interesting question, and and you know, the current generation, the last couple of years, right, is seems uh, uh, unique in history, but it's also just sort of evidence of a pattern in history. Um, you know, uh, a few years ago, um, there is the the fiftieth anniversary of the Kerner Commission report. So, for those of you who don't know it or haven't read about it. There's something called the Kerner Commission. Uh, there's a report that they did on the state of uh, uh, the nation and issues of, of race, uh, kind of following all of the, the social protests uh, and actions in cities back in, in the 60s. And there were all these findings that this group of people came together and said, you know, these are the concerns and the challenges and reactions and responses. And so, you know, fast forward 50, 50 plus years, and it's it's sort of a, a, a repeat, right? So um, what people may be experiencing as sort of a, a reaction or response to an emergency or event or kind of an epoch, like an instance in time, we have to know and acknowledge that it's connected to all of these things, right? Uh, all of these histories and legacies and systems and experiences that that are uh, very deep in their their origins, uh, and so I do think, especially for you all that are in, in school, right? That that work of kind of uh, harvesting history, harvesting experiences, and and knowledge to understand that it may appear that something has gone away, or or kind of uh, uh, is is I think, I think you said less visible. But it's it's still there, and and it actually can and should be our work to make sure that it is remembered. And um, my Mellon hat on for uh, working with some folks in, in Richmond's capital, Virginia, and was sort of the Confederate um, uh, capital. And uh, it's a, a group of Black women, and I'll put the link in the chat later. Uh, that were from an area of, of Richmond called Jackson Ward. It was the, the historically kind of black uh, district. People may know Maggie Walker, she, black woman in, in the bank uh, in that history. Well, in that area, though, there is a highway that was cut through. So we all know the history of urban renewal on highways. Um, and there is an, an old home uh, that uh, was built by a, a many minute of Black man that had been freed from and purchased his own freedom uh, and built him. And they built the highway, they had destroyed uh, that whole community and they moved this home. So there's a group of Black women today who are doing the work to return the home <laughs> to their community and to, to mine that history and, and to use that as evidence for a way to people in Richmond to talk about their full history and everything that that they've gone through collectively and and to remember right that uh the conversations that that may be happening now in this moment sparked by something like george floyd right it's it's actually a, a continued conversation and it's actually to our benefit to not see it as something that is uh a flash or <laughs> or an instance right uh definitely with with you know something like um, uh, these kind of structural issues that we see during disaster, whether it's flooding or, or uh, energy crises and, and things like that, like these are all connected to much longer histories and advocacy that needs to happen sort of all the time, right? It's the, the all the time work uh, and orientation that, that I think we need to, um, uh, I think, pay more attention to than. Uh, then uh, comes across. Now that said, institutions are very good at keeping the status quo, right? I, I, 
I'm, I'm not a big fan of the AIA. And like every time the AIA publishes something about Whitney Young, it's just like my eyes roll all the way back into my head. Um, Cause it's like, okay, that, that was a very long time ago. And what have you done differently? Right. So institutions are good at, at sort of saying and presencing things. Um, but uh, it's sort of on all of us collectively to, to do that ongoing work and, and memory work um, uh, to, to acknowledge, um, yeah, that things like mutual aid, things like food sovereignty, that's been a long time, right? It's not, it's not a current fad. Uh, it, it, it's how uh, humans have survived <laughs> to, to the society that we have today or mutual aid and things like from sovereignty. So, uh, so just, yeah, just think about history, I think more uh, in, in that work when, when feeling sort of discouraged if something feels like it's falling away or not, not important. Uh, uh, it, it's actually in a long legacy of, of continuing uh, the work. Just reinforce what Justin said. I, I think I learned that recently. <laughs> I was I was kind of clueless. I think I, you know, we with the pandemic hit and we started to talk to disaster relief specialists and trying to think about how to do it. And, and they said, you know, Deanna, the, the disaster is not the issue. It's the disaster comes in and just amplifies all the problems that were already there. It's not the disaster itself. And I think the community organizers we've been working with, I've been realizing, you know, they've been on the ground for decades fighting the things that you're seeing day after day after day. So we have to be very, especially in this American culture about our sensationalism and the media and all the things. The fact is people were on the ground 10, 15 years to stop jails getting built or to shut them down or whatever your topic might be. And uh, they have schooled me and I've learned because I, I was like, oh, yeah, we're just coming in, saving the day. I'm like, no, -uh, we're, we're, they've already been here and we're just coming in to help help at this point. But um, and I also tell my own team, you know, the arc of justice is long. We have to stay the course. What are your values? Stay the course. Just day in and day out effort put into doing it while you keep loving and caring for yourself. And I love the work of um, emergent strategies, um, Adrian Marie Brown and her approach to activism. You would love and care for yourself um, in it because you don't want to also, I've seen a lot of burnout. So how do you do the social justice work and not kill yourself? Um, that's the, that's where at this, that's what's kind of exciting new thought, actually, it seems to me that we're actually trying to think about how to do the work so that we can stay the course without burning out our bodies and our souls. It, it, we, we can't afford to lose people like that, so. Okay, thank y'all. We love injury, Adrienne Marie Brown, love her emergent strategy as well. Um, so this one, the next question by Emily, I don't know if she want, they wants to ask the next couple of questions, but it also kind of leads into um, kind of legibility, um, legibility and that language, because when it does come to catering to certain communities and groups and how do you begin to formalize that? What does that look like as urban planning? Um, I know um, all y'all showed a different variation of that when it comes to divestment or just in divestment in community and kind of, you know, making a place more habitable for the person to feel like that's their place you know, when adding the trees and kind of that growth cycle, as well as when it came to Deanna and deploying those structures. And so um, I don't know if you want to ask, this is talking about infrastructure. I don't know if you want to ask this, Emily. Want to ask out loud or you want me to read it? Yeah, I'm sorry. I mostly wrote that in the chat just because I didn't want to end up just like word vomiting because I do tend to do that. Um, but first of all, thank you all for being here. That was an amazing presentation for all of you. So it's really an honor. I'm actually an alumni, but I, I had to come back for this when I saw this and I, I was super excited and really it's an honor to be able to see you guys' work and everything. Um, I wrote a lot, but essentially what I was trying to get to is that um, kind of like what how Deanna was describing uh, restorative justice as this thing that people kind of think, oh, no, that's not going to work when it's actually working and happening actively. Even people are still just like in this like denial. Um, there's these things that are 
reality. They are really happening, but people still can't see them as realistic. And I feel like that's something that kind of translates over to architecture really easily because of lack of visibility. Um, and it's really great to be able to see specific projects and work like this. But I'm, I, what I wanted to ask you guys is more about how you feel like we can continue to make this more realistic and more active in architecture, especially for people that want to be part of this work. But it, you know, the field, even just like looking for jobs or things like that, you, what's most present and most active is what's still dominating the entire field, which is a stereotypical kind of job that doesn't have these priorities at all. So um, yeah, I wanted to see how you guys felt about how we can make this reality seem more realistic, if that makes sense. I mean, Emily, you're saying how do we, like where you are even in your professional career, how do you begin to manifest the reality that we want to see? Is that, am I understanding that right? Like we know that there's small things happening, right? But it needs to catch fire, right? We need a lot of people looking at this stuff. I mean, I think I, one thing I always say is that I worked for a long time for the man. And I had to do it so I could learn how to do my craft in my profession. There were no public interest design firms at that time. There was no nothing. And that was okay because I was learning. So that now when I go to serve my community, I'm a highly skilled professional architect who brings their professional experience and expertise to the work. And that in the meantime, was trying all different things, learning as much as I could so that by the time I got there, I could, you know, be to serve, but I think it was also finding a way to do my regular job and explore this manifesting of the other things on the side at night, on weekends. You know, I'm not advocating for not having any life. I'm just saying this is just how I did it. <laughs> and uh, that I, I was like in the box of the corporate architecture world learning, right? A lot of good stuff that I use every day, right? It was not for nothing. It was very, very valuable experience, very valuable time spent. And I needed to have something else going on to feed my soul and to begin to manifest this other reality. There's no way I would be doing any of this work had I not learned all those things and been doing some small things, right? Just starting small, small stuff is great to begin to, and then amplify it, right? So we have a advocacy wing of our, we're a strange architecture firm with a little advocacy component so that we can, you know, if you make a little thing, then you can, then we scream about it, right? Look, you can, I made the tiniest little dinky ass thing. And then, but we can make it because we did it. It's a postage stamp, but we did it, right? And it's enough, right? It's really enough. So small steps are, are really valuable. They're really valuable. And you can do that. You can do that now. Yeah, I, I definitely would echo that. And, and you know, it's it's in tension with the, the like, you know, self-care and life balance and all of that. But the, the work that I've been able to do is because I've had at least three jobs for 20 years, right? <laughs> Just being perfectly honest. Um, uh, but part of that is like what what works for me. Like I I'm not a if I were doing like one single job, I would be bored out of my mind and very unhappy. Um, uh, so people are wired uh, differently. For for me, being able to do different things and be in different types of spaces and di have different sort of skill sets was was quite um, valuable. And eventually, sort of over time, things sort of self reinforce the other. So I I. Uh, worked obviously in, in government, but then I eventually started my own uh, kind of work, the work uh, in my community uh, in Indianapolis and then eventually started doing other things and, and it, it sort of reinforced each other. And it, it's sort of not putting a lot of pressure on a job uh, because why should a job be everything for you? Uh, just like you don't, uh, expect, uh, you know, the job to expect you to be everything for them, right? It's a two-way dynamic. Uh, so take that pressure off um, a, a little bit, uh, uh, I think, can help and, and leave some time and space to have your own exploration and work. 
and definitely echo Deanna's point about the kind of the smaller project uh, where you can have more uh, uh, sort of direct influence authorship, the sort of ability to test things out, test ideas. Um, uh, and if you don't have sort of capacity in your own power to find spaces of collaboration where those things can be done as well. Um, but, but the idea of, of the, the small thing or the proof of concept that people say no to uh, ha has been proven again and again. And for those, again, for those in New York, uh, all of the pedestrian focused public spaces, you know, and 15 years ago, that sounded bananas to everybody. Like, why on earth, how could you do this? This isn't how the city's used. It's wrong on 50 different levels, both technical and political and everything else. People with paint proved otherwise. And now there's been radical transformations of, of space. Just saw an article the other day, they're planning to do it to Park Avenue. Uh, you know, unimaginable, right? It, it's now almost normal to, to configure the city in that way. And literally 15 years ago, a bunch of like hippy dippy type bike people, <laughs> right, that were on the fringes were advocating for, for that kind of change that's now quote unquote best practice. So it, it's, it's definitely possible, um, uh, but finding for you, what works for you personally, uh, for your practice, I, I think is, is important, right? It has to, it has to be uh, fun uh, for, you, for you to do that work. And we have um, another person in the chat that wanted to go ahead and ask a question, so. Um, yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much to the, the three panelists. This has been amazing. Um, and, and Chandra, you talking about Chicago made me really homesick for it. So that was wonderful, thank you. Um, my question for you all is um, just about the role that, um, that, that non-Black, um, planners and, and you know, like a planner, other planners of color can play in, um, in fostering care environments. Um, you know, I, I thought what was said about, you know, like looking at the community where you're from was really powerful. Um, I guess in addition to that, are, are there ways that we can be involved in, um, you know, creating caring environments in, you know, urban communities, which, you know, often are, you know, predominantly black communities where those battles are, are really playing out um, right now. And I guess I'm thinking specifically about, you know, decarceration and abolition work, but just in general, do you, do you feel like, um, you know, there, there's a role to be played there and, you know, how much can we do? And then how do we also kind of stay out of the way? Yeah, I would say we need everyone in this work. Um, so if, if you have a passion, like chase after that, because I, I think that's important. And this question often comes up when I present about the framework and how we center blackness and indigeneity and, and what that means for other folks to, to get involved in that work. Um, and I think to the, to the points made in the land acknowledgement, it's about being in relationship with those folks. and being able to move beyond solidarity to sacrifice. Like this work requires that we give something up so that it can make room for other possibilities for how, for how this, these systems can exist, how they can operate. Um, and so I think that, that those roles are, are important. And for me in this work, it's about having a willingness, uh, a need and, and desire to do the work of, of building new systems and and fighting against ones that aren't serving everyone, particularly um, Black and Indigenous folks. So I think that requires deep self-awareness of the space that you take up and where you can make more room and, and make more space for other voices. Um, but I, I believe that that work starts once, once you can go from solidarity to sacrifice.
I agree with Chandra. Thank you for saying that because it's it's sacrifices so required. And and I will say that just on a really practical level, we do have one white gentleman in our firm, and he's very valuable as an ally because you know often when we're and he's done his work right he's done his race work and and um is 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 clear uh we are as black women a lot we have a lot of black and brown women in my firm and we are in a white male dominated profession and coming up against some pretty extreme both misogyny and racism i he will come forward to a deal with those folks when i need to take folks out of a situation where there's harm you know, we ideally don't want that, but that does happen. And he plays a valuable role as a white ally, uh, male ally, and is willing to go in to take the bullets, basically, or and, and deal with those folks and tell them to their face what's going to happen and what's not. So I, I think there's a lot of role. That's just one example, right? But people are coming from various cultural contexts. We talk to everybody. We work with everyone, whether they agree with us or not, because that's we've got to solve the problem. So we don't have time to 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 not talk to the folks on the other side. But we have to care for ourselves. And and many people on our team have been able to shield and protect other folks on the team when we're in a safe when we're in a situation where there's there's harm happening. So. Yeah, I'll just add that, um, you know, obviously spent, spent a lot of time working in direct public service and, and uh, 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 the, the range, what we call in the, the practice, the multitude, right? So not talking about diversity, but talking about the multitude, right? like all, all of us that have been impacted, affected. And again, I'll, I'm going to sound a broken record, but going to certain histories and learning and understanding uh, the histories um, uh, that have shaped uh, so many of our cultures, um, you know, uh, racial capitalism, uh, whiteness, right? They've, they've constructed a lot of very um, curious innovations, let's say. Um, and, and one of the major projects of, of whiteness is to uh, uh, Construct distinctions and, and differences that uh, are uh, counterproductive, uh, and and to continue to to sort of suppress Black people in in particular in the society, um, and having a, a greater understanding of that history and acknowledgement and awareness is sort of part of of the work, um, and. Uh, you know, just sort of seeing that pattern track of, of when uh, uh, Black people or people of African descent in particular are uh, made to be othered. <laughs> um, uh, there, there's just a lot of work that needs to be done to understand that history and how it's connected to other histories and, and to use that as, as a kind of a common ground for understanding the kind of work that, that you need to do, but also the differences of privilege and access and opportunity uh, that you may or may not have access to uh, in, in the work. Um, but but it's, it's an important question, I think it, a really an essential one um, uh, that, that we have to continue to, to, to push on. Thank you guys. Um, so we're getting close. So, um, chat, you had one uh, question in the chat, then we'll do a closing and uh, get out pretty soon. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jared and Sydney, for organizing and Diana, uh, Chandra and Justin for sharing. That was really excellent. Um, presentations and uh, like I had two questions, but I think I'll, I'll just focus on the on the last one um, about just the role of institutional or systemic or um, care coming from, let's say the state, right? Or policy versus sort of interpersonal communal care. And obviously as architects, urban designers, urban planners, we're often intersecting with power, right? Um, but then at the same time, there's certain things that um, Jared mentioned, mutual aid. Um, that is happening on the ground. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, where they intersect, where certain things kind of need to be within the kind of state level or 
um, you know, that more systemic level and where things kind of belong in, in the more interpersonal communal care. Yeah, I think it's important to think about kind of what your orientation is towards this work, because I think as a student, my orientation was very demand based. It was focused on these are folks in power. Um, I need to take some of that power from them to me so that I, uh, I'm able to, to live a life of ease and, and healing. Um, but I think now being in my career, it's much more focused on just demonstrating what's possible. It's not asking for permission. It's not waiting for those demands to be answered. It's saying this is this is a, a tomorrow that I can create and there is power in the communities that I'm in to model that. And I think it starts with the relationships that I have in my communities and how we show up for each other and how that then gets amplified in a model for what um, folks in institutions can do. So I think it's important to make that a distinction and to, to find folks of not just similar and, and shared pain, but also similar possibility and, and what that can open up when, when you're able to shift between those two orientations of demand and then modeling what's possible. I don't, I don't wanna be sound very pessimistic, but an, an important uh, issue right now is that the, the kind of civic, uh, connection, uh, our sort of collective uh, understanding, engagement, all of those things are in a, a pretty challenging place right now. Um, you know, the, the, so the institution or the government for all of its faults uh, over, over time have largely been responsible to change and evolve to meet the needs of, of its um, society, obviously to very varying degrees of, of success, uh, but, but that largely has been uh, sort of the whole point and purpose of, of those governmental and institutional spaces, right? I, I joke with people, I love street lights and clean drinking water, you know, and public schools uh, for, for all their faults. Uh, they're, they're pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, the, the question of, well, about where that power belongs is, is in crisis, right? Like there's been the increasing um, uh, concentration of, of power through wealth and, and other kind of social and political dynamics that, that um, lead, I think, to sort of a, a crisis of confidence uh, in, in the, the kind of the public and, and social infrastructures that, that we have. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, Eric Leinenberg is, is book with the libraries uh, in, in that role, like people are trying to find well, what's going to be the, the thing that will help us help people kind of get it that something like government or shared infrastructure and responsibility are, are a good thing, right? People are, are, people are really grasping to figure out what that thing is, um, other than in theory, the internet or whatever that allows our connectedness. Um, so I, I think where that, that our lives is also seeing an unprecedented amount of, of resource from private industry, you know, the technology companies and all the you know, people sort of competing for um, uh, how we are together, right? And, and like in every possible format possible. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I think the, the, the work that you're seeing with the community-based initiatives and, and, and projects are operating in a way, trying to operate outside of that system, acknowledging that it, it's very difficult and challenging to get the government to make those investments. Um, that said, I, I, the urbanist in me believes that, that kind of public spaces and, and kind of communal spaces, uh, actual direct interaction are where we can see some real shift in progress there. And there's a lot of work and research on this social cohesion that uh, can be improved through public spaces that can improve things like civic engagement and, and participation that are there to impact and affect the power structures, right? So that space, I mean, the, I, I love the pop-up village, oh my goodness, like, right? That's 
um, uh, uh, a product began showing, okay, here's a street and people are together and able to see and interact and, and value things like their collective health, right? That it's very real and very tangible way to, to demonstrate what happens when people work together. So I, I think that tension is, is, is um, uh, there and I think it's a place to, to push. The, the response where responsibility lies um, is different from where power lies, right? And so we have to find more ways for people to navigate that and, and to exercise and, and shift it where, where, where we can. And I do think that designers have a role there Right, because we we can work in the space of vision and visualizing, and demonstrating uh, what a shift in, in power responsibility might look like. Right, um, but I, I think the, the the roles it needs to be sort of a continuum scale uh, for where and how that work is happening. Uh, and frankly, we have to to be a bit patient and, and sort of go with the weather a little bit in terms of, of finding the right place and the right time to push government uh, or and or institutions, which are a different version uh, of that scale uh, to, to see some shifts. We have time, so, and I think Chandra and Justin said it beautifully. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're at time. I just want, I. Um, Gonna put in the chat for all the students here. Uh, left, thank you. We're gonna have an after-hour decompression session where we'll just talk about this event, talk about our work around these topics, things like that. So please join in. Um, I want to allow everyone to have final comments and um, some questions that I want to throw up in the air that we never got to, but we were really excited for are uh, on the topic of what takes care to black care. What, what is the difference between those? So, and then um, also, and sort of navigating these white institutions, we talked about that earlier. And so those, that's one of the topics that we are really um, interested in. How can educational institutions better center um, the ideals? that we've talked about today. So you don't have to really navigate them anymore. Maybe that's too idealistic, but you know, um, one can help. Uh, so I wanna thank everyone and give um, all the speakers one last um, remarks and, you know, closing statements. Uh, I'll jump in first again, thank you all uh, again for being in the space and, and definitely to all the organizers that you've taken their time and energy to, to make this space for, for people in the conversation. Um, uh, and you know, there are these great list of resources that you all can check out our work and different projects. Uh, do uh, you know, sort of be curious learners and exploring. I, I think that the takeaway that I, I would give and leave you with is there's great work that's happening now and things are very present. I do think that there, especially now that you're in school, there is so, so, so much to learn from the past. Uh, and, and it's a, a work and a responsibility uh, that, that I think uh, unfortunately doesn't happen as, as much as it could or should in, in design spaces outside of um, I, what I would argue is a very kind of white Eurocentric kind of approach to mining history or crafting a history for a particular narrative and instead of having a more complete and uh, kind of whole understanding uh, of a kind of a full and complex history that includes things like black people, or black and brown people, uh, diaspora and migrant and other peoples uh, as, as being important and valuable. Uh, it's a little more work, uh, frankly, to, to do that, but it's, I promise you it is worth the time and energy that it takes to, to connect with uh, a, a wider and broader history. I can just say thank you so much for having me speak. I really love talking with students because I just feel like the questions that are asked are blow my mind. When I was in school, there was none of this to being talked about, I assure you. 
So this so brings me sort of some great joy to hear that there's spaces like this in the academy. Uh, it's incredible. And, and even to know that um, you all are able to have this forum, that we can support it. I want to support it in any way I can. And know that, you know, the, the path is yours, right? The path is unique and unique to you. So getting clear about what you're most passionate about. You know, if, if it is about Black care and, and supporting and, and elevating the lives of Black folks, great. What aspect of it, right? And, and follow your heart and the part thing that really lights you up and that you can do it, right? And that's because that's what's that's the light that will sustain you through all of the hard parts. And there are lots of hard parts. So you have to like have some fortitude and really believe what you're saying in the face of a whole bunch of people telling you you're crazy, you can't do it, you know, way to, like you'll get a bunch of that, but um, you'll also get a lot of support. You know, the universe will support you. So clarity, purpose, and aligning it with your heart's desire is, is essential. And yes, do your history work. That's the first thing I did before I dove into this. I was like, has anyone ever done this before? <laughs> that ego, watch that ego, man. It'll get you. <laughs> Anyway, thank you. I'll pass it to you, Chandra. Thanks. I just want to echo deep gratitude for this time together. Um, I am always grateful for the opportunity to learn with students. And I was thinking about when I was studying urban planning uh, as a student, I was, I was angry because I wasn't seeing myself reflected in the syllabus or in the coursework or the way projects were framed. Um, and I got to a point where I had to recognize that that resentment was information. It was information for myself that I'd given too much, that I have given up too much um, in, in that work and that I had to set better boundaries. So my friends and I created uh, a syllabus that we called FUBU for us, by us. And we had a list of the texts like bell hooks and uh, the urban planners that weren't named urban planners like June Jordan. Um, and, and we were able to work with that. And I got to work with my professor, Tony Griffin, on, on thinking about all of these ideas. So find your people, find your tribe, and, and use that, that anger and to, to orient you to, to where you need to go. Because <laughs> we have a lot of work to do and, and we got to keep going. So um, I hope you got a little bit more fuel in this fight from this conversation. And um, can hold on to, to what gives you ease going into the rest of the week. All right, thank, thank you all. Um, yeah, Sid, any last words? Thank y'all. That's all I gotta say is I really appreciate it. And I don't know, like we said, it's, it's just nice being able to hold a space like this that it still is hard to see ourselves in the curriculum as we're in fifth year in this program. And it is something that becomes very um, emotionally tasking and I guess mentally tasking once you're cranking out design and design after design. And it's like, like you're a machine, but you're also a machine studying Eurocentric, very washed and surface level. And it's hard to, well, it's not hard, but like to be indoctrinated almost sometimes when it comes to urban and is in architecture and other design heavy programs is a weird indoctrination, almost like a hazing. I know people might get mad at me when I say that, but that's how I see it. And we have to reflect and look back and kind of go back to what is our interest. And like you said, begin to make our own syllabus and understand what we can begin to formalize out of that. Um, I appreciate seeing the projects tonight and I thank you. Welcome. I'm glad I passed that over because I couldn't have closed any better. Um, thank you, everyone, and have a great night or whatever time it is for you guys. <laughs> thank you. Night.